All right. Hi, everybody. Today we're talking about how to be an effective step parent and how to have a great relationship with your step kids. I'm Maria Rieger, your resident Gemini, and this is Positive Parenting with Astrology. And with us today, we have Amy Stone, who has been a stepmom for over 20 years and is a coach specializing in helping step parents have great relationships with their kids. Thanks, Amy, for joining us today. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Uh, this is a, a I have a lot to say about this topic, but I'm going to do my best to keep this focused so we don't go over, you know, an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, I'm interested in this topic because you're a stepmom and I want to get into your dynamic in a second. I'm coming at it from the point of view of the biological parent and uh, my second husband, who I'm divorced from now, was the stepdad to my son, who's now a teen. My son is now a teenager. Uh, and I was also a stepkid. My mother has been married three times. So my father passed away. I had a stepfather, she got divorced, I had another stepfather. So I um, come from this topic from that perspective of the stepchild and also the bio parent. So I'm really interested to get your point of view. I wanna ask you first, uh, can you tell us how you got to do this type of coaching, specialize in this type of coaching? And yeah. also your uh, what your family dynamic was. I know you came into the family. I think you married somebody who had kids That's right. already. So yeah, let us know. That's right. So yeah, there's a couple ways that blended families and step families form. Um, there's I, I I will say there's like almost unlimited ways, but they fall into a couple different groups. Like there's the Brady Bunch method where everybody brings kids. Um, there's the method where you've got somebody who doesn't have kids who joins somebody who does have kids, and then Sometimes there's the blend of that, like the uh, blend is the wrong word because that's what we use to describe the families, but um, the overlap, which is that people add kids together. We call them the Irish babies, right? So those are the three different kind of ways that separate this the circumstance. Um, I love that you have the experience of being both a stepkid and a parent in a step family, like a biological parent, because... What like what brought me here is my experience as a step parent, right? But the one of the things that I think is so interesting is that this is something where everybody seems to know somebody who either is a step kid or knows a step kid or is a step parent or knows a step parent. And the only reason that that is relevant is that there's so little support. For people who are trying to do this on any spot of that, for step kids, for step parents, for parents who are cohabitating with step parents, any of those situations, there's so little support. And that is kind of shocking when you think about the number of people who are living in this experience. Now, I'm not going to say that there's not a lot of spaces that are dedicated to complaining about these situations. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. What there's not a lot of is the, what are some things I can do? <laughs> yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So in your, um, in your situation, when you married uh, your, your husband who had kids already, did you bring kids into the relationship? I didn't. Uh, my husband is a little bit older than I am. Um, so I met him, I dated him, um, and he had been, I didn't know him when he was married. Um, I came in after that. So he already had two kids. We started dating. Um, and then we got married. I charged into this situation with all the confidence that you can as a 20 something year old thinking that what could possibly go wrong. And then we had kids together. Okay. So, um, so I have two kids. My husband has four kids. I, when I introduce myself to people who don't know me, I will say I have four kids, two stepkids and two kids. Um, and so that is the construct. Um, my husband's first wife also remarried and she had two more kids. So I love this because uh, my, my stepkids are two of six. Okay. Um, my kids are two of four. Um, my stepkids half siblings on the other side, they're two of four, but the two oldest kids are two of six. And so it's like, we are this like great Venn diagram of yeah. interconnectivity. I, I love the fact they have siblings because I think one of the great things about growing up with siblings is you have someone else in your same generation near enough your age that is going through similar experiences yeah. as you. 
my yeah. son doesn't have that he's an only so and he has me and then he has his dad and his stepmom his dad remarried so um but he doesn't have the peer that is going through a similar situation and i that's like the one thing I lament for him is that he has friends he's close to and he talks to us like he talks to me, but I'm not a peer. I can't as much as I can empathize and I do try to empathize with him. Like I've been in your situation when my dad died and my mom got remarried and all these things. Like I know some of what you're going through, but I cannot pretend to know exactly what it's like for him. And of course, it's a different generation now that we right. have social media adds a whole other level. And I can't pretend to know what it's like to be a teen right now. A hundred percent. And, you know, my kids had very, they were my kids and my stepkids uh, and me in an earlier version. Of me. I was not looking to my parents for, you know, I didn't believe them. Like if they were like, yeah, yep. listen to us, we have experience. I didn't believe my parents and my kids rarely believe me. Every once in a while, I will see them where they're like, oh yeah, okay. You know, she knew what she was talking about. But you know, those times are few and far, far between. Yep. Most often they're like, you don't know. <laughs> well, and kids, you know, and I'm sure you know that, that especially teenagers are developmentally hardwired to be oppositional to parents because yeah. they are individuating. And it's right. very they're frustrating. I get very yeah. frustrated with that too. Like, dude, I've lived this. Like, I'm 48. I have done this. I know what's going to happen. I can help you. And I ha I feel myself start to get really frustrated. And I have to watch myself because I have complex PTSD and I could get emotionally dysregulated. So I have to watch myself and just calm down and take a step back and be like, you know what? If you need help, I'm here. Right. And I'm no. going to step back. <laughs> I think... You know, I think that, I mean, I think that a lot of people, um, I mean, I think that you, A, you get a, a positive check, a gold star, because you're aware that you have CPTSD, yeah. because that's harder for people who don't have it or who are currently thinking they have ADHD, but is actually PTSD or a combination or whatever. Um, and so you, you have a bonus because you're on the lookout for it, right? You're aware of it. But I generally think that that awareness that our children are individuating, um and and letting go right which sounds easy and is not um i think that's one of the biggest challenges that adults who are cohabitating with teenagers and in the doing the work of coming together to raise families i honestly think that's one of the hardest things that people do i mean i probably tell people several times a day i'm in different conversations and like what do i do when i have discovered that my kid is this and i'm like nah, you say there there they go <laughs> yeah you let them do it and it is so hard especially when we when it mirrors the things that we would not want to have repeated for yeah. ourselves so you know if we were bullied as kids or if we moved a lot as kids or if we struggled in school if we're kicking ourselves because we wish we had done more in school and then our beautiful charming miniature carbon copies of ourselves are look like they're doing the exact same thing that is so hard to watch yes. that is so hard to watch and yet there's no other, there's no way to save them no. from the experience. And I always say on this channel, like natural consequences are the best teacher. Yeah. Amen. And I, the way I think of that, and I parent, I use a, incorporate a lot of spirituality into my parenting yeah. and on this channel. And, you know, you're entrusted with this soul and this soul has their own journey. They have their own trip. And so, yeah. Yeah. And I really do think, I think that, so I really differentiate myself between con like all consequences are really natural. Like, so like a punishment is an artificial concept, is Absolutely. an artificial intervention. Right. And, um, and I kind of think it's in a lot of ways, it's the only teacher. Mm -hmm. Like we, right. I love it when educators are like, some kids are experiential le learners. And I'm like, really show me the kid who's not. You know, introduce me to the kid who's not. Introduce me to the human being that is learning in this life without actually experiencing it, right? Mm -hmm. Some people learn through the experience of reading and some people learn through the experience of like recreating for themselves. You know, there's different ways of experience, but I think it's all experience. I think that that's like a, an illusion that there's somebody out there that can just, you know, go through this and pick this up by not experiencing it. I will say that one time I had a friend who taught himself to um, windsurf by reading a book, which I still think is stunning, but 
most of us would actually have to get out there and try it. Yeah, mo- I, I would agree. Most of us. Yeah. Maybe there's some person who's just, yeah, I don't know. They can visualize what it's like. And, right. You know, take a, to account like the direction of the wind. But <laughs> Right. If I hadn't seen it yeah. happen, I wouldn't be no. telling the story. But he was like, that's I can so do funny. it. I read the book. And I was like, I don't think that's going to sure. work. And then he went out there and was like, this is what the book said. And I was like, oh, I'll be. It's crazy. You know, yeah. all right. <laughs> you know. It's crazy. But yeah, I the, the lessons stick a lot more if. The, the you know, through experiential learning through natural consequences, yes. and and somebody, a coach I respect, a parenting coach, told me recently, when you tell your kids something, like tell them what to do, they they've heard it before, right? They've heard it from teachers, they've heard it from coaches at school, you know, sports coaches, they've heard it from the other parent, and I was like, I that really resonated, and I thought, man, number one, I, you know, I'm a parenting coach, and I can st- I'm still learning stuff myself. <laughs> And two, like I, I get really careful about when I start to get in that lecture mode. And I hate that. I'm really, I'm, I'm really good about not lecturing my kid because my mom lectured me so much as a kid and I tuned out. But um, that's, yeah, that's, and when, when a child has step parents, you are getting that from multiple sources. Two parents. Oh my gosh. Yeah. If you're lucky yeah. enough to have the two bio parents involved, yep. uh, the two parents, and now the step parents. So you've got potentially you know, double the adults telling you what to do. And I, I implore yeah. parents and step parents to think about it from the kid's perspective and their perspective of, you know, self-esteem and self-confidence because yes. we're preparing them to be independent adults, but constantly focusing on what they're doing wrong is counterproductive. It is, right? Um, it is. And that's hard to see in the moment. I do tell people sometimes a story. So I... Um, Every once in a while, an adult will step in um, to like as a step parent or a girlfriend or a friend like of the family, whatever. And and the distance is actually beneficial. So I tell the story of when my stepdaughter was 13 years old and like went through the teenage transformation overnight. Like one day was a kid and the next day was a teenager. And to me, as someone who was not invested as closely in the first like eight years of her life, I wasn't around. Right. Like, so it was a, this was like a sitcom moment. She was like, there was a family gathering and my parents were like, you have to be here for the important family gathering. And she was like, no, I need to be with my friends or my life is over. Right. Like everything, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. You are the worst human beings that have ever existed on the planet. And my life is obviously over. Right. So there's this giant dramatic meltdown happening and in two different houses, like across the thing, like my husband, I think has may have been boyfriend. No, definitely husband. My husband and his ex-wife were, you know, like, oh my gosh, who is this alien that has shown up in our house? And meanwhile, I was across the room and I was like, do you not remember what it's like to be a teenager? Like, how did you miss this? Like, do you, how did you miss this? And that it doesn't happen a lot. And I'm not going to, you know, say that. But in that instance, every once in a while, and I could have been in, the, in this story, I'm a stepmom, but I could have also been the neighbor or a girlfriend who would have been like the check that was like, hello, this is what 13 looks like. Like, this right. is why we make fun of this in the movies. <clears throat> And, um, and it is, you know, and it is that process. And, um, and then, you know, we had this family gathering and we all stood around and talked about like, how much would they have to pay you to go back to middle school? You know, a lot, (laughs) a lot. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's, I love that you have that detachment because it, and I've talked about this before on this channel, I'm floored when I see parents that it doesn't seem that they remember what it was like. I remember what it was like. Like I carry my childhood and my teen years with me yeah. consciously. I remember what it was like. I remember having the meltdowns. I remember, you know, getting the lectures, all this stuff. And so I bring that with me and think, yeah, I went through this and I remember what I needed that I did not get. And oh, I try good, to give yeah. that to my kid. Like, yeah, I need space good. or I needed to be yeah. able to go my door and close the room for a bit and just be by myself. And I respect that. Yeah. I think that sometimes, and this is just a theory. I don't know if I'm right. This is my opinion. I rate, so being around my stepkids and my kids as they were teenagers has been enlightening to a version of myself as a teenager that I was sort of unaware existed. Um, I, as a teenager myself, I thought I was a delight. 
I thought I was just absolutely spectacular. And, um, and yet living through the teenage years with my stepkids and my kids, I realized that, and I mean, and this is true of me as a person, I have a very high risk tolerance. I'm a challenger of, of, um, of authority. I had trauma and I have like these lingering things, you know, that go on. So I was not actually as much of a delight for the adults who were in the process of like trying to actually to get me to stay on track. And, um, but I didn't realize it at the time. And, and I find that hilarious. I find that hilarious because I would watch these other teenagers push the boundaries and I was like, oh, crap. I remember doing that. Oh, there's been a couple. Like, I remember catching my teenagers, stepkids, and kids doing things and realizing why I always got caught as a teenager, right? Like, I was not as good as this as I yeah. thought I was. Um, so that was one of the well, early ones. I was ones. so smart about no. this, and I wasn't. <laughs> and I wasn't, right? It totally wasn't. I, wa yeah, I totally remember. Re that was an early one. Um, I was like, oh, that's why I got caught, because I sucked. And, um, and then, like, yeah, and I... And then also dealing with, I like watching my uh, stepkids and my kids push boundaries and negotiate things that were, you know, and, and, and thinking to myself, oh, <laughs> this is super obnoxious as the adult in the room who does know the answers, right? So like the number, you've got one kid, so multiply it times four. Um, the number of times I've had the discussion trying to convince somebody like hey, your life will be less full of stress if you will just get this done on time, mm -hmm. right? Like if you, like, if you don't put it off until the right. very last minute, mm -hmm. you, you will enjoy your life more. And, and none, I have one, one of the four is an engineer. She, right. She like, makes a timetable and does it. That's the way her brain works. But the rest of them, they never, not once still oh, yeah. today. Don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Last. Yeah. And they're adults, right? Yeah. Yes. So I, Maybe that works for them. I don't know. There are, and you know, there are people, I'm a planner, like you said, like right. I, when I was in middle school, high school, I did not wait to the last minute to do projects. My son is more like that. Um, now, girls also mature at a faster rate than boys, That's right? What they so, say, yeah. Th yeah. So, um, and uh, the teen years, there's that, the way the brain is structured, they're, they're structured to be more dopamine seeking and more, more dopamine seeking. So you have to, they can't, yeah. right. They, they also have to, like, like account yeah. for that too. Yeah. And they can't think all the way through to the scenario. Yes. Like, so I, this is something that I very much did not know. Like I learned this as a parent. Um, and, um, and I wasn't, so I wasn't as helpful with this with my step parents, step kids for sure. But that process of that, that awareness that they don't know how to think it all the way through. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the work we like, if we can regulate ourselves and not be super pissed off at them when they do silly things, it's not helpful to say, you know, why did you climb onto the roof with no plan? You know, why did you turn, you know, think you could do your homework in five minutes? That's not helpful. But what is helpful, right, is if you can like take 10 minutes and do the calming mechanisms and then walk them through it as an example of that forward thinking. That's how they learn that skill. So it's like, right. okay, so right. you were standing next to the house and you thought to yourself, should I go on the roof? You know, and then, and then what, what could happen next? Like asking those questions and teaching them how to role play that. That's how they learn right. that skill. And I, I did not, I did not realize that. I did not, I don't yeah. remember learning that as a kid. I don't, um, I do remember doing silly stuff as a kid. I remember yeah. turning around and, and realizing, I, yeah. I do. I have had that conversation recently with other parents. Like in school, they don't teach the kids like study skills and how, well, not generally, they don't teach them how to think. Right. right? Some teachers do and some classes do. It depends on the, the school, but most of the way the schools are, most of the schools, the way they are structured, at least where I live, is they don't tell you how to study. And I realized that. I'm like, hey, I told my kid, studying is actually something I can help you with. Like how to study, how to organize your notes, right? How to plan your, your exam studying schedule, whatever. I can help you with that. Yeah. So if you need help with that, I can do it. I have had conversations like you described, like, you do this and you do this and double check work. And I said, what I mean, double check work when you do your math, homework, yes. go back and redo the problems from scratch. That's what I mean when I say double, double check, check yeah. to me, double check maybe doesn't know what that means exactly. 
So I said, redo the problem. And if you got a different answer, something is going on. And if you need to help yeah. understanding the material, your teachers can help. I can help. It's only so, so much I can do with math. That's not my strong suit. But, you know, yeah. computers can help. So we could get to that. But, yeah, so it's a it's an interesting thing because I've had this discussion for twenty years with educators that were my kids. I was like, listen, it is not helpful to look at a room of adolescents and say, if you think you need help, come to visit me. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't think they need help. In fact, Absolutely. they're positive that they don't yep. need help. And you know when they discover that they need help is when they get the test back. Right? Yeah. So this is a disconnect. I, it like is constantly frustrating me. I'm like, so there's nothing wrong with office hours, right? But a more helpful thing is, hey, everybody come once every other week to office hours, like give them a framework that they can implement when they're learners so that they can do it. I don't know. I think schools, I think idea. that one of the disconnects between the school system and the people who are in the school system, the students, is that when I think about it now, right? And I don't do a lot of talking about this because I'm, I'm almost about, I have one more that's still in the school system. And, um, and, and then I will talk about it more because I think there's actual consequences of talking about the school system while your kids are in it. Um, is that the people who become teachers are the people who did well historically in school and they enjoyed the process, right? Um, and that's a small portion of the kids who are in the classroom, right? But it is interesting to think about like, of course, the person who liked school and liked studying and didn't struggle became the teacher. It, that's not actually the person who's best suited to look at a room full of kids and say, oh, <laughs> How, what help do you need, right? And that was a that was actually a thing that it's something I've been thinking about just myself a lot. It's like, you know, a lot of coaches are their own first client. Like we are coach E zero, right? We start from our own experience. But then, for me, there was a point where I was like, oh, you know, well, my right, my experience is only valid for me. And what I'm really helpful for is if I can take you know my experience and my knowledge and back up, back way up and say, what is happening for you and what tools do you need? And then instead of trying to shove my experience into your life and be like, you know, the answer right. for you is to do things the way I did it. Right. If instead I can have the distance and be like, yeah, I'm happy to tell you what I did, but I'm also happy to talk about what are the things that you're doing? What are things you're interested in trying? What are things that I've seen other people do that might help? Because what other people actually want is what actually helps them. I also think that regarding, um, so I'm 50, right? Um, school does not look like it did when I was in, in school, like you were saying, right? <clears throat> so I ended up in uh, a meeting with somebody and the, this person was trying to help a kid like get organized. And they were giving a lot of tips that were, I thought were valid. Not like, you know, empty out your backpack, use a paper planner. Yeah, I totally thought they were valid. But the reality is that the whole paper planner thing is a little bit out of date since most schools are using online mm -hmm. assignment settings. And so we were in this weird setting where the kids were like, why would we write it down when it's written down over there already? Like why, you know, like it didn't, it, there was a failure mm -hmm. to communicate. And I thought it was really interesting. I was like, oh, this is wild. This is wild that like these two people are not, there, there's a technology mismatch. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah, it's totally, totally different. And then the teachers have to update. They didn't always update. And they don't. Like, my son missed homework because they didn't update. Or the, it wasn't like I would go into the system, the online system, and I would get completely overwhelmed. Oh yeah, and it was, yeah. and I was just like these poor kids. Um, I uh, those are great points. I talk a lot on this channel about school and school environment. I want to go over with you, Amy, and ask you two kind of step parent specific. Let's do it. Topics and get your take on this. Um, and I'm going to call them, I guess, like threshold questions. Okay. People who are considering becoming step parents. Like oh, if you're great. involved in like in maybe a dating or a relationship with somebody who has kids. Um, one is, and this is something you and I talked about the first time we talked on the phone. Um, if you're the you know, potential step parent, let's say, and you are not interested in having a relationship with the children. 
if yeah. you are only tolerating the children so that you get to have a relationship with the bio parent. If you have no interest in parenting at all, we'll talk about what that means for a step parent. But if you have real, no real interest in forming a relationship or you see this child as an irritation and something to tolerate, do that family a favor and do not get involved in that relationship. Yeah, I think that's fair. I really do. I mean, if the kid, if the person in that situation was an adult, right? If like you were married, like if you were like remarrying and the kids were adults, maybe it would be different, right? right. But there, I t one of the things I tell people is I say, you know, there's no version of my relationship with my husband that doesn't include his kids, right? right. Like he's, he's always going to be their parent. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I do think that that's mindset work and reality check that people should do, right? If you, and, and I would extend that also to really look at that extended family, right? Um, it, he's got a connection to, my husband has a connection to his first wife. It's pretty distant now, but it was pretty intense when the kids were little, like mm -hmm. they're busy doing the things. And so, I mean, there were definite moments where I was like, hey, listen, you know, like I, I have to get my mind around the fact that this is a package. Right. Now, I think there's a lot of flexibility in that, right? Like, so one of the things that step parents will sometimes voice is that they feel pressure to have a certain kind of relationship with the kids. And I do think there's a lot of flexibility in there. I really do. I think that if you um, are willing to talk about it and you are willing to be intentional about it, you can really define what this will be like, right? So, you know, if you're an artist and you work in a studio all day long every day and you do not want to do sports with the stepkids, right? I think that that's fair. I really do, right? I, I think that that's fair, but I think that it is in everybody's best interest that hopefully before you are totally enmeshed with the family, you have those conversations, right? Because right? I think those differences um, happen all the time in first families, right? I think yeah. that, you know, if you've got, a, it, like if Picasso was your dad, I bet you that he was not, you know, like he, he needed time to do his thing, right? Uh, I have a family acquaintance where the, um, one of the parents is a, uh, Merchant Marine. He's gone a lot. Yeah. Right. He's gone a lot. Military families. There's all kind of things. So like one, like, so yeah. But if you, I did a survey a long time ago when I was starting this and I asked a lot of people, um, like if there was one thing that you would like to change in your relationship and your family, what would it be? And uh, all, uh, like uh, so many people, hundreds of people were like, I wish the kids didn't exist. And I wish the ex didn't exist. And that was wow. heartbreaking to me wow. because- that's not a situation that actually happens, right? That's not a situation that's realistic. And if you are uh, waiting for that, if you are pinning your happiness to that, that's not, that's not going to happen. No. And, you know, just what you said to your point, Amy, you don't stop being a parent when the kids turn 18. No. Or 21 or 22. And then what's going to happen is you're going to want to spend holidays with the adults, kids. Marriages, grandkids. You're going to want to see grandkids. You're going to yes. want to maybe, you know, spend, if you are lucky enough to have excess money to spend money on the kids. And then what happens is the step parent, you know, well, I don't want you spending money on the kids because blah, right. blah. Well, but they're my kids. And, no, 100%. I you know, always, so I do. It, yeah. It doesn't stop when they're 18 right. or 22 or so that's a huge. So, I mean, I. I, it may sound harsh, but that that's what I tell people. Like, if you really cannot see yourself in a relationship, like you said, is, yes. is, is with this package, do that family a favor. Don't get involved with them. They deserve better. The kids deserve better. And go. And go, you deserve better. Yeah, you deserve better. You Find deserve somebody better. Somebody who's right. not everybody. A parent exactly. And, and have that the is they have to have contact with. Yeah, that is the question that probably more people should ask themselves. Yeah. What about this Early, is, the is the, the right. And it's like, what about this is the best decision for me? Right? Like, so the way it comes out the way people describe it, I'll put some other phrasing that maybe echoes for people. Cause I talked to 
I've talked to hundreds of people, right, over the past couple of years, right? So people will say, my relationship with my significant other is perfect, except for the ex, the except kids. for the perfect. kids, right? Yeah. You know, and, and that that is a false statement because there is no relationship with that person without the kids. Like, and it's, it's confusing because often because of cohabitation schedules, you have time right. just with that person, right? right? But that's that. And here, here's the deal, right? In my opinion, um, kids are stressful on a family, right? Kids are stressful. It doesn't matter if they're stepkids or first family kids, right? Adding a child and raising a child is an enormous stressor. It's super expensive. It's super expensive. And it is the black hole of resources, right? Like there's no amount, there's no limit to the amount of work that it takes to raise kids. Yeah. And this is something that I was particularly unaware of until I was in it. And it's not because people don't tell you, right? Everybody tells you, you won't sleep. You won't have any money. You won't go to movies. You won't go out to eat. You hate your vacations. People tell you that ad nauseum. But it is one of these tricks that like humanity plays on itself that it's like you can't hear it or understand it until it's happening to you. Like oh, yeah. it's like that, you know, it's like, you know, people are like, you're like, oh, well, it'll be fine. I don't sleep much anyway. Everybody and then, does this. It can't be that bad as they say. Oh, right. It's so yeah, hard. So. It's so hard. And I, and I, I only had, I had one at a time. So um, I recently heard a story of a person who was having triplets and I just was like, I just, like, I just wanted to send her all my money. I was like, you funny. need an army of people to help you my, with this. My old neighbor had triplets because they could not conceive and they had IVF and had triplets and the triplets, I kid you not, were 12 months old and she got pregnant. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And they were shocked because they had been trying forever. And you know, so it does three, happen. Yeah. Months old and a newborn. <laughs> Yeah, no, that does happen. I know, I know a lot of people, so. and you're so sleep deprived at that oh, point yeah. that you know I, I it's mean, like you're not paying crazy. attention. Yeah. yeah, so and they were the same. The triples were the same age, born the same year as my son. So she would call me for stuff like, I can't get to the store to, for diapers. I'm like, <laughs> I will send you what. I, she lived across the street from me. I'm like, I will send you whatever you need. And I had. I'm uh, like, I have it easy with just one. A hundred percent. I had. Uh, there was a mom in my town who had triplets, and they were triplet boys that were the, the age of one of the kids. And so, like, I as they aged up together, I've seen them all over the time. But I do remember. I remember running into them in the park, and you know, they, you know, they, they, they pop out of the strollers and all head in different directions. Yeah. I just, you know, I was like, oh, you just, oh, that's a lot. It's, it's a, a lot. lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Um. So the other kind of threshold. Uh, I guess issue or question I have, and I think this is a little more nuanced. I'm, I'm interested to get your your guidance on this. Um, I think it's very rare that two adults see a hundred percent eye to eye on parenting, whether right. they're both bio parents or bio and step parent. Hundred percent. So there's always some, almost always some compromise. I think though that if the step parent cannot support how the bio parent parents like it's a complete deal breaker yeah. and there's very little room for compromise i think that's another threshold issue you may just have to avoid the yeah. relationship like and i think that we i would definitely want to get to like when you're in the family like the blended family like how do you handle the discipline i want to get to that but first i want to get to this kind of threshold issue about like can you support their parenting so and i think yeah agree? So when I, um, so I have, I have some slightly disruptive views about this because I think that this is basically the thing that puts a wedge in a lot of families and people don't realize it. Um, I think it's easy to not be aware of somebody else's parenting style when it's not, when you are not involved in the process, right? So like when you're dating someone with kids, you don't even, you, you may not even pay attention to the things they're necessarily doing. Like, so um, my husband is one of those people who he would eat at restaurants every meal of his life if you left, let him, right? Um, and so I didn't notice that he, when he had the kids, was basically going from diner to Denny's to, you know, you know, to, to Chinese food, right, when he had them. And that might seem like a funny thing, but I didn't notice because we were dating. And you do eat out, right? Um, and then when we began to cohabitate, I realized that one of the reasons that these kids were maybe struggling with modulating their moods was because 
they could use some regular meals and that mm. people don't need milkshakes three times a weekend, right? You know, so anyway, I think that that's one of the things that you can learn. And, right. um, and so I want to give sensitivity to the fact that sometimes it feels like these things are like a two by four to the head when they happen to you. You're like, how did I miss this? But I do think that that's part of the courtship process. Like we don't show people our flaws and we don't even realize what our flaws are to other people. So there's that. Um, the other thing is that, um, once you like there, so there are thresholds of this, like you're saying, like, it's different when you don't live together, mm -hmm. um, what you have to put up with. Right? right. So what do I care whether you do time after or not, if I'm in my own apartment, right? It doesn't affect me. Right. Once we start to live together, it's more of an impact. Mm -hmm. And one of the places that I tend to be disruptive in this process is I don't think it's fair to ask another adult to just go along with everything that you do if it impacts them, mm -hmm. right? I believe that anytime they're impacted, they deserve to be included in the conversation. It doesn't mean that they get to make the decisions, but right. they should be included in the conversation, right? Um, and so, and I extend that, by the way, to when the kids become adults. So one of the right. things is like, if I've got a family and they've got adolescents, I'm like, hey, this is when we loop the kids in. Mm -hmm. to how we're making these household decisions. So the process of coming together to figure out how we're going to make decisions in the family is a process. It's like a never ending conversation. It's going to be different when you're single. It's going to be different when you cohabitate without kids. It's going to be different when you have a newborn. It changes a lot when you have an adolescent. It changes anytime there's a disruptor, like if somebody's sick or, you know, somebody has a diagnosis. Yeah, somebody has a broken bone, like all these things change. So it's something learning to have this conversation and make the adjustments. Um, that's the process that I think is the magic sauce. And I think that people underplay that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think they're unaware of it. I think that we have this like standing human assumption that this is automatic, that we should all know it, but it's a very intentional thing. It's like setting up the process of how will we safely have this discussion? What are we going to do when we disagree? Right. Because right. one of the things the, like I, so my parents were divorced. I had this like weird idea that a good marriage meant that there was never a disagreement that people would never yell. Right. Turns out that's not actually the way relationships work. Right. There's no version of my life where I agree with my husband on all of the things. Honestly, like honestly, yeah. sometimes. Right. Like so you're, I mean, you've been married. They, yeah. There are times where you're not going to agree. Right. And so figuring out how you're going to do that, that is, that is really, really important. And one of the things that I had to learn, that I have learned, is that being able to disagree and move forward mm -hmm. is part of the process, right? Yeah. So there's not, there are times where people won't always agree, right? And that happens in first marriages, and it happens in blended families, and it happens in parent-child discussions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're operating with this idea of how do I get them to do this? How do I get them to do this in my way? Sometimes that's not the way it is, right? Sometimes the, the reality is it's like, hey, I, you think this and I think this, mm -hmm. and now what are we going to do, right? What are we going right. to do? How are we going to handle this? How right. are we going to handle it? How are we going to move forward? And mm -hmm. so, you know, this comes up in school performance. Um, it comes up if uh, in choosing extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. um, it comes up in evaluating all kind of things, all kind of things, right. and um, and people deal with it in different ways. Some families have a decider, right? Mm -hmm. Like you get to decide. Um, in a blended family, sometimes there are tons of things that I just did not have to be involved in with my stepkids, right? But there were other things that, you know, I really, it was helpful if I was involved sure. in. Sure. And there were things that I knew and I didn't know. Um, I remember one time, like we were working, like we had a kid that was not excelling in school and we were all trying to pitch in and I had to raise my hand and be like, I do not know how to do this. Like, it is not helpful for me to be involved in this. Like, please let me out. Right. Right. Um, and, and so being able to do that in all of those situations without feeling like you're sacrificing your relationship, right. it has to feel safe, right? It so much of home life comes down to creating a safe environment for people to 
right. make mistakes right. and to be yeah. vulnerable, right? Like, so, you know, for uh, for me to st- say, you know, um, I have a fruit fly flying around my little microphone. Like somebody bought, somebody had, the, year? <laughs> somebody had the nerve to buy a banana and I'm on like a war with a, the fruit flies in my house. But it's like, it's like, don't buy produce in the summer. The, um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, like, so it had to make it safe yeah. to say, yeah. I don't know. And to make it safe to say, I don't love this. Like, Mm -hmm. is there anything else we can do? Mm -hmm. Um, Noise level in a house. Who's going to do chores? Mm -hmm. Um, How clean it's going to be? Who's going to change the diapers? You know, are we going to? And so there's all these things, right? And so, yeah, so that's kind of where I weigh in on this, that there's no there's no one formula. And I think that one yeah. of the things that can go wrong is that people will have the idea that there is a formula. Like, so the right. formula that I was given, right? Because I, I, this, this resistance to this comes from the fact that I was told as a new stepmom that I should defer to mm-hmm. the decisions that were made by my husband mm-hmm. and, his, um, and his, his first wife. There are tons of times I did, right? Mm-hmm. Like when the kids got their physicals for school. Or maybe I have what n- extracurricular activities they I have do. no opinion, yeah. right? I have no yeah. opinion. Don't need to be involved. Didn't affect me, right? Whether or not they cleaned up at the end of the day in mm-hmm. the house where I lived, mm-hmm. that was one where people were like, no, you should let your husband make that decision. He, it's up to him whether or not he gives chores to his kids. Mm-hmm. And one of the days, one of the pivotal days in our, my, my marriage was the day that I was like, this is not actually about chores. Mm-hmm. This is about the living standard of me yeah. in my home. Right. And I looked at my husband and I was like, I don't care if they do it. I don't care if you do it. I don't care if you hire the neighbor kid to do it. But we need to agree on a standard for how we're yeah. going to live in this house. That's really important that you were yes. like, oh, these kids need to clean, clean up because oh, like I did slobs, that first. blah, blah, blah. No, I did yeah, that but first. But it's like, you know, but it's like, and I, I, I agree. Kids yeah. should have chores. And I talk to my son about this all the time. This is about pitching in to the team. We we're right. on the same team. Now it's just you and me at home. So we're small, but we're on the same team. And I told him, I said, when you leave, with all due respect, when you leave dirty clothes on the bathroom floor, the message I receive is that, well, mom will just pick them up. And I'm not a maid. And, and he's like, I'm, I know, I'm sorry. I'm like, you don't have to be sorry. And I don't get mad about it. I'm just like, gentle right. reminder, pick up your stuff. Your stuff goes in the hamper. I gently remind him, can I do your laundry? He does his own laundry when his yep. bed is full. You know, yeah, no, I, and I'm, not, a big one. I'm not a hard, you know, but about it. I'm, I'm like just gentle reminders. Like we all, you know, and there's ourselves and I'm not a neat freak, man. You probably, my house is probably not up to your standards. No, I'm that's not a neat well, freak, but pick up after yourself. That's just common and, courtesy. And the thing is like, listen, I failed in all four kids in getting them to pick up wet towels. So I, I openly <laughs> admit that. Um, I'm a big, I'm a big one about closing the door. Um, and when it bothers you, but that's different when it's common, when it's common spaces. And, So one of the things that happens in blended families is that the divorced parents sometimes have a lot of shame and guilt, right? And um, and that's unfortunate because you should not be carrying. We know it affects the kids, right? On some level, this is hard. Like it, like and the kids are going through it, and it's they have no control over this. They were right. The kids situation. That's right. The kids did not choose it, and that's Mm -hmm. definitely. And so my husband was really he was outspoken about the fact that like he didn't feel like he wanted to give them he wanted time with them to be friends, which sometimes is called being a Disney parent. Um, which is not a great name, but it, it's, it is used in the thing, but I'm, I'm not big on labels, but that is the label that we use. And, um, and I was like, yeah, that's totally fine, but that's different from, you know, me having to live with right. board game pieces under right. my feet every evening. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, and the second part of that, that, um, that I will just lay out there is that I had to deal with the fact that I was like, it is not. I cannot take on responsibility for somebody else's guilt, right? I I just cannot. He has to deal with that, right? So when his guilt is impacting my life, that's like an adult discussion. That's an adult discussion. And he can deal with that on his own, whether it's through therapy or support groups or whatever. But that is something to deal with. And I've I've struggled with that myself. Absolutely. Saying no to my kid and him being upset with me for saying no to something. And I have my own triggers about that. But like, that, and I know, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because I felt that guilt too. I'm like, I'm the one that left both my marriages. So, yeah. you know, I mean, that guilt is real, but I had to really think that me doing things or not help, you know, not 
preparing him for life because of my guilt. That doesn't, not saying no to him, not having boundaries does not help him. The other I thing, had to come so, to that conclusion, yeah. Right, so I'm not divorced, right? So that's the, that's the actual situation I'm in, but my parents were divorced and yeah. I grew up with that story that like di- my parents' divorce was a hardship for me and it was a negative experience. Like that's the, the people told me that. Right. right. People told me that. Um, and there are surveys out there that will say that divorce just all by itself are traumatic. I will say as a 50 year old woman, when I look back on my parents' relationship and my experience, their divorce was actually the beginning of healing in my family. Um, and so I would, I tell people all the time, I'm like, I really think it's important that we work hard to reframe this. There's a lot of old thinking in that line of thought that divorce is bad, that weddings are celebration. Like, you know, like it's like, it's like, it doesn't have to be that right. The divorce can simply be the uncoupling of a relationship and the next step to the next level of healthy relationship. Right. So, and, and, and we get mixed signals with this, right? Because we don't say that to widows. Right. We only say that to people who make the decision, right? And I'm not going to say that it's not easy. Like the, the data is that financially speaking, like so socioeconomic conditions, how much money you have is the number one driver for the stability of the kids, right? Like, so if you are struggling financially, it is harder to raise a kid. Kids are expensive. We reflected on that, right? Um, and divorce is very expensive. It's very expensive. <laughs> Running two households on the same budget, very expensive. Very, very expensive. So that's the reality of the situation. But, you know, that's it. And I wish that I had hard, cold data to throw at you. But the yeah. other truth of this is that we don't do longitudinal studies about this at this time. And so all we have are these made up pieces of things that people want to throw out as actual information. I, I will say I have a lot of adult friends who said just what you said, that that their parents should have gotten, well, you didn't say, you didn't say this exactly, but right. in, ref, in reframing the divorce as something positive that can start a healing process, my adult friends said, my you know, my parents said they waited until the kids were in college to divorce, but I wish my parents would have gotten divorced earlier because they hated each other. Right. You no, know, that's was, really that, unfortunate. The home was so anxiety inducing. Or yeah, they had a and, very poor relationship model. And that's something I really thought about. And like, you know, I'm on my own. So I have a lot more energy to devote to my relationship with my kid. A hundred percent improved because of that. And yeah. I love what you said earlier. I don't I want to make sure we highlight this because you said about making the home a safe space where the kids, yeah. bio kids, step kids can speak up. None of the techniques we talk about, you know, getting them to do chores will work if you don't cultivate the relationship and you don't cultivate yeah. that safety because i had when my mother got married for the second time all of a sudden this dude's living with us and i was 14 at the time and he was like do this do that and i was like no who are you right, and right. i got in trouble and i'm like who is this guy telling me right. what to do and just coming in my room without knocking to tell me what to do like my room like i'm a huge introvert people on this channel know my room is my haven i close the door don't come in yeah you know yeah. and i'm like who is this dude And, you know, we got in trouble and we got criticized and like, it was like, and I'm like, he, you didn't even try to develop the relationship with us before telling us what to do all the time. No, a hundred percent. It was a lot of resentment on well, me and my brother, man. We were and how, and how was your, was your brother older or younger he than was, you? He's a year and a half younger than me. So we were about the yeah. same age. You were not looking lot. for any more adults to tell you what to no. do. <laughs> no, not at all. We had plenty yeah. of people tell us what to do all day Exactly. <laughs> And people do, one of the questions that people ask all the time is, you know, how do I, how do I develop a relationship right. with my stepkids? I think that you asked that at the start of this. It's a wonderful yeah. question, right? Yeah. Um, and, and it, this actually, for people who are not step parents, you can think about this, how do I cultivate a relationship with a kid of mine that's gone through a transition? Like, so people do, parents go through this when their kids are adolescents and they're like, oh my gosh, they're not the same as they were anymore. How do I keep that right. connection? How do I develop it? Right. The when you think about how you develop relationships in your life, it's where you have shared interests, right? So your stepdad came into your life and was trying to get you to do the things he wanted to do, right? Now, if they had been the same, you probably would have been like, woohoo, let's go do it, right? When they're not the same, it's not reasonable to assume that people are going to want to do it, right? right? And sometimes in families, we do things with people because they want to do them 
And that's the rule of the family, right? Like, um, you know, if it's my day and I get to plan the activity, the stepkids and my kids, they all tag along and they're not always super happy about it, but they're doing it because right. they love me, right? right? That's scene one, right? But the, when you're coming into a relationship or you're coming into a thing, you're trying to make a connection, the, the pro tip to try, it's not infallible, it doesn't always work, but is to focus on the things that those people are already doing. If they like YouTube videos from Mr. Beast, watch those and strike up a conversation, you right? You described our household. <laughs> right. If they're into Minecraft, open up your own Minecraft yeah. account and talk yes. to them about that. Yes. If, um, and, and, and I say this with the full knowledge that you are probably not going to care at all about what that thing is because it is the interest of somebody else. But right. maybe you'll discover that you like it. Um, well, if it's something cool. Yeah. Like, you know, yes. If you're and this, yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, um, and that, uh, like that, I, I it, it is a very, very helpful thing. It's like, don't assume it also gives people permission with adolescence, right. Um, it gives people permission to try new things, right? Like, cause we lock the people around us into like habits and when they change, we can sometimes be like, Oh, well, why aren't you doing the thing you used to do? right? Mm -hmm. We used to sit on the couch and watch Jeopardy. Now you want to go do a workout. Like, why is that, right? So that will create division in a relationship where looking and seeing what people are doing. And, right. the, and the, the way I accept it is like allowing the people you love to be who they are without exception and Absolutely. loving them for that, which yeah. is not always easy because sometimes people are little jerks. Um, those people are toddlers um, and, you know, toddlers are very, you know, but also sometimes people make bad decisions, right? So if you have a person in your life who's engaging in self-destructive behavior, it's very hard to love them during that mm -hmm. process, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, we aren't in charge of getting them to change that. Right. Um, and so finding a way to separate your thoughts about what they're doing mm -hmm. from your thoughts about the person is, is, right. is that path. Sometimes yeah. that means putting distance in it if they're doing stuff that's really dangerous. Right. But you, you know, loving the person. And for step parents, there is a thing. You get to define some of this relationship. So mm -hmm. early on in um, – my blended family life, my husband said to me, hey, you know, I really, I wish that you would love my kids the way I do. And I remember thinking about it. I was like, I don't even know what that means. Like, but I'm pretty sure that that's not actually possible, right? Because you love them the way you love them. And I just need to love them or like them or engage with them the way that I do, mm -hmm. right? And have that be genuine. Right. Absolutely. I right? think like, when at, at the beginning of that step relationship, like depending on the age of the kids, obviously, like you let the kids largely define what the relationship is going to be. Right. Like. To your point, you don't force them in a relationship. Like my my first stepfather, I think he assumed we're going to be this close family from the right. get go, and it's like that doesn't happen. Re meaningful relationships take time to develop. Yeah, and I've you heard know, that with yeah. um, when you move kids in together. I've heard stories of where the parents Absolutely. are like, "Oh, well, you guys are now." Oh, here's your sister. And you're like, no, Excuse this is me? a stranger, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is so, a stranger um, and you've asked us to move in together. Yeah. Right. But so accepting the kid you have. The kid you have. Kid or step, step kid. That's the kid you have. Um, also, like you said, I love that, that what you said about showing an interest in things they're interested in. Like, what's the goal here? The goal is to form this relationship and create this feeling of safety. Right. So you show some interest in what they're interested in, even if it doesn't rock your world right? exactly like, i'm a gamer that's actually one thing my son and i bonded on early on we started playing first wii games and pc games and other things um so but a lot of most moms are not but i tell them don't criticize for example right. minecraft or pokemon you may not like it fine you don't have to like it it's fine but when you criticize stuff your kids are interested in, you're criticizing them by extension. And of course, that's felt yes. more strongly. Like if you're the step parent, that's not going to help the relationship. Right? And the, the trap um, sometimes is, right? So our kids are watching. The young people around us are watching what we do. When we criticize things that other people do, mm -hmm. um, they hear that, right? When it comes to creating a safe environment. Right. Our kids watch how we behave. So if you are constantly making fun of things that other people do, they will A, see that as an example of what you should be doing, but B, they may be less likely 
to speak up if they like that same thing. So, right. and you never know what that is, right? You never know what that is and what it's going to be. On that point, it is not impossible to walk this back, right? When when you make a mistake as a parent, yeah. um, as an adult, as a step parent, it's actually not impossible to walk it back. It feels weird to do it, but where I have finally come to this from um, after making many many mistakes continuing to make mistakes, I still make mistakes, is that I think that that process of the recovery is maybe the best lesson we can ever show our kids, mm -hmm. right? So um, I like, okay, you know, do, curfew with teenagers, right? Like I'm not as reasonable at three o'clock in the morning as I am the next day at 10 in the morning, right? So like I have very many times absolutely, you know, been unreasonable in the middle of the night and, and been like, that's it no privileges ever again, your life, you know, right? I, just the weirdest stuff ever, you know, right? And had to walk it back the next day. And and I felt like I was like, you know, first I felt like I was like giving in and not, you know, doing these things. But now I realize I'm like, no, you know what that is? That's the repair in the relationship. And so Absolutely. I, right? And so and that like, is so important to the health of the so relationship. It's so important it's to the health yeah. of the relationship. And so the Gottmans, right, the Gottmans mm -hmm. who they did the marriage lab, they did this thing. And not everything they do is 100% and, you know, uh, all of these things. You know, they're people like we all are. But when they did research years and years ago in their marriage lab, they came out and said that the sign of strength and resiliency in a marriage was these things they called repairs, mm -hmm. which is when people would go through certain things to bring each other back together. And I would apply that over through your family and maybe even yes. with coworkers, like yeah. don't have the assumption that you're going to be perfect all of the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, who I is? I can't show any weakness. I'm the parent. So I have to say right. what I said. No, you, you can be unreasonable too. An authentic apology is so valuable. Especially if it's something you don't know anything about. I remember yeah. one of my kids was like, um, was like, everybody is on Instagram. And I was like, no, that's not possible. And then I went and surveyed the kids and it turned out everybody in the sports team was on Instagram. And I was like, Are, you know who's wrong? Me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. And, um, and I just was wrong, you know, and, and, yeah. and I love that example because so many times that's not the, that's not the way, like the kid comes back is like, no one is going to the sixth grade dance. Actually, probably everybody's going to go to the sixth grade dance, but you know, like yeah. it feels yeah. right now, like nobody's going to go. But I, you know, I think the, the step parent has a really unique opportunity in the relationship precisely because they, they can, and I'm, I'm not, it's not always the fun, carefree dynamic, right. clearly, because you're living together and you're instructing the kids and you're going to have, like I tell my son, it is impossible for two people to live together and not be irritated at some point yes. with each other. It's just going to happen. But the, what is important is the repair, just like you said. But also the step parent has a really unique opportunity to have, be, you know, be a parental figure, but also be kind of like the fun aunt or the fun, yes. you know, like my sister, who's younger than me, doesn't have any kids. Her relationship with my son is completely different. It's fun. It's carefree. They make fun of each other. They have a great time. He loves going to her house just to hang out on the sofa. Yeah, it's completely different. Now, I'm not saying that there's there's no you know, can't be any discipline or structure in the relationship with the step parent, but you also have I like to think about it as this really positive opportunity to have this awesome relationship where maybe. You don't always have all the pressure the bio parent yes. has. That I, that I mean, there are times I can think about times where I was like, "Oh, I have some distance," and I have yeah. this. The I love the way you said that. The way I say that generally is that. Um, so it's a weird thing to build a business based on your family, and it's a very strange thing to like spend as much time as I have looking back at like how I did this and all the mistakes I made, and, um, so on and so forth. But the decision that is always there, the decision that was always there for me that I didn't realize is the choice to do my best to add to creating a healthy, uh, beneficial family, whatever that looks like for people, because that can look right. differently, or to unintentionally or sometimes intentionally, sometimes people are intentional. I'd like to give people the benefit of the doubt and say not very often, but, you know, unintentionally be doing things that create more conflicts and instability. Instability. Mm -hmm. um, that was the decision that was, I think, always there at every step of the way. And I was unaware of it forever and ever and ever. But 
it, through that lens, if you look at the things that you're deciding and the decision you're making and you're like, what is my, the words you use were unique opportunity. That's a beautiful question, right? That's a beautiful question. And, um, and, and it's empowering, which I think is so understated and undervalued in the parenting space. You go into any room where you're talking about parents and it's like, you know, a hundred people who are ready to knock you down and tell you all the things you're doing wrong. Absolutely. Right. A lot it of is a, there's a lot of, pressure a lot of pressure. I just talked about that on another podcast. So much pressure to be perfect. A like huge amount aspect. of pressure, right? A huge amount of pressure. And if you can take a deep breath and be like, what is the opportunity for me to do something loving or right. caring or kind, right? you know, whatever that is. And that doesn't always mean nice or easy, right? Loving and kind can be you don't get to go to mm -hmm. the party, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, like it's, but, you know, or or speaking up for people, um, you know, on their behalf or, you know, whatever it is, right? But through that lens, like what feels like love here? What feels helpful here instead of am I doing the right thing mm -hmm. or am i applying these parenting principles correctly right. you know um i think that that's empowering and i wish that there was more of that like i i know a lot of people who will peaceful parent themselves into a shame cycle you know like yeah. i wasn't peaceful enough and mm -hmm. it's like i guarantee you i guarantee you that you know, there's everybody hits their limit. You go, you try and take yeah. three kids to Target after everybody's it, had the yeah, flu. There's no peaceful. No, I there there have been times. <laughs> there have been times I hit my limit. Right, and I, I'm way better about recognizing when I'm close now. Right, but um, and my son's also very sensitive, so I can even if I raise my voice a little bit, he's like, "Mom, don't yell!" I'm like, I'm not even yelling, dude. You want to see yelling? Like, my right. mom yelled at me. Like, but I'm like, you're right. Like I'm getting agitated. I'm not yelling yet, but I'm definitely like, and my son can tell he's like, I want to ask you something, but I can tell you're a little bit irritated right now. So I'm not going to ask. <laughs> I'm like, right. I'm not even irritated. And I'll tell him I am not irritated with you. It has nothing to do with you. I'll be right. honest about that. Like you see me irritated. It doesn't 99.99% of the time it has nothing to do with you or me being a parent to other things. Right. I'm hungry. Like, I'm tired. Right. I'm exactly. hot. But I, yeah, it, it's yeah. important to recognize that. And like when kids are old enough to understand that, express that. Like, yeah, I, I've had a really tough day. That's why I'm very angsty and irritated. I have a short fuse right now. That's yeah. just how it is. Yeah. Not an excuse, but, but yeah, that repair is so important. And, yeah. um, and I love how you, how you phrase that, that, what kind of when you're in doubt about well, what's the correct thing to do here what's in line with like good parenting however you define that think about what feels loving to me what will help the relationship right now yeah right no and, and so, i yeah. think yeah and I, like especially because you're you've got an adolescent and we talked about adolescent um you know adolescents are pushing boundaries a lot of them not all of them yeah. but a lot of them and um and and the the mental process at some point becomes what relationship do i want with this adult child exactly um and um and not the, the this is a high stakes calculation right because we all know people who do not have relationships with their parents mm -hmm. um or go through long periods where they don't have relationships with their parents so like you might think that you know turning your house into a very strict you know um prison like ward is is doing everybody a favor but and maybe it will right i'm not here to say that it won't but the other possibility is that what you're showing them is that their best option is to not have a relationship with you. Yep. Um, and and as step parents, um, I I have lost count of the number of relationships who have crumbled with this, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, if you your stepdad came in and he was laying down the law right? Mm -hmm. And it puts stress on the family and it puts stress on the house mm -hmm. and your relationship to your mom, that is for in, hopefully the duration of the child's life, right? right? You know, it's like forever, ever and ever, right? And so then the parents have a choice. It's like, okay, well then, you know, can we stay together, right? right. And you don't even realize that that question is on the table, mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, it's like if you want the relationship, 
then you actually have to choose the relationship, which is a really kind of academic way to think about it, right? But it's like, you know, choosing the relationship is the choice. Exactly. Um, and my mother, she was only married for like a couple of years to that, to my, my first stepfather. Um, but I'll tell you, when she ended that relationship, he wanted to maintain a relationship with us. And we said, no, we weren't interested. Right. And he had no legal standing because he was a step parent. And, and, even, you know, yes. and, and, and he had a huge breakdown about that. And he cried to my mother because he didn't realize it meant losing the kids forever. Right. And, and my mother said, right. they don't want to have a relationship. They don't want to see you. They don't want to talk to you. That's their, that's their call. And that happens with biological kids too. Yes, like, absolutely. Like, um, you yeah. know, it's, it's less common, so you don't see it all the time. Yeah. But, you know, there are plenty of kids who wake up one yeah. day and they're like, hey, you know what? I'm going to go stay with Aunt Susie or I'm going to yeah. go, you know, stay at a friend's house. And then they're like, I'm going to try not to come home. You know, mm -hmm. I don't like the environment. And, um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, it does happen. Um, it does. It does happen. And it's something that a lot, I mean, I'm estranged from my own mother. I've talked about it openly on this channel and I have limited contact with her and that's my choice. And that's for my mental health. But, uh, one, one thing I, one positive thing I think comes out of social media is that 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 being estranged from your parents is very lonely, but it's putting right. me into contact with a lot of other people in my position. And there are a lot of us. There are a lot. A I think um, that is the benefit, right, of yeah. this uh, abundance of social information online right. is that things that we thought were rare turn out to not actually be as rare. Right. And, um, and, and that's a really powerful scenario and um and so nobody would wish estrangement on anybody else right um but there's layers to this right like mm -hmm. thank goodness we live in a time where you have the ability to make that decision and mm -hmm. live independently right that's like a really great time to be alive and um and find support in other ways and then the second layer of that is awareness that this is more common than we thought mm -hmm. um is that's that's information to put into your data bank for how you mm -hmm. want to live your life, right? Because if you right. don't know that that's a possibility, you might make different decisions, right? Um, and uh, yeah, and and uh, yeah, all of those things. Yeah, I mean, guilt is still, I mean, there are adults who feel guilty for not being in contact with their parents, and that's the only reason they're still in contact. It's right. It's personal guilt, right? Even though they would probably be happier, have more energy, be able to devote more time to their own nuclear families. But that's their choice. You can't make that choice. And it's life, guilt, but, yeah. but I mean, also, right? There's this word that like, people hate talking about. Like, it's like we, I feel like we talk about it all the time. But you are, we are socialized that good kids take care of their parents. Good exactly. people, you know, like that. Yep. That's how, that's the good girl takes care of her parents. Right. The good girl does that. You know, right. also probably the good guy, whatever. Like, but I never have lived as a guy, so I talk about a good girl. Um, and that's a hard lesson to step outside of right but when yeah. we have a, i i mean i can totally remember the therapist that was like listen if people are not being nice to you you do not have to hang out with them and i was like what if they are related to you and they're like even that right yeah. even that it's like and a, it was a, like what sudden realization right. you're like this epiphany like oh yeah i don't have to hang out with these people this i remember one day as an adult thinking like wait, I'm an adult and I'm financially independent. I don't have to do any of this stuff. I, uh, so my parents had a very high conflict divorce and they fought all the time and they made the holidays crazy. And as an adult, I remember I like was like, uh, no, I'm not traveling on these holidays. I was yeah. like, if you want to spend the holiday with me, you're going to come visit me. And I was like, oh, and newsflash, I'm not playing the one parent, two parent like yeah. game. Like you will yeah. be expected to behave right. and be in the same space. And if you can't do that, then don't come. Exactly. And Still, they yeah. did it. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, Amy, this is a great conversation. We're gonna have to we've gotta wrap up here. Yes, I've yes, got a yes. Time constraint. I have a time constraint, but I want to have you back on because man, there's a lot of stuff uh, I would love to keep talking about. Uh, that we haven't had a chance to cover yet, but really want to thank you for your time. And please tell uh, listeners uh, where to find you, what your website okay. is. And you have some free resources, I think. I have a, a bunch of free resources. A step parent yeah. survival kit. So if you want to tell listeners yes. where to find that, that will be great. 
Um, I love to give stuff away for free, so there's free stuff. So uh, my name is Amy, and I have a website that's amysayso.com. Um, I do mentorship and coaching directly with people, and I also have a product, a standalone product, which is called Step Parent Success School, um, and that's a course. So that has its own website, stepparentsuccessschool.com, um, but you can find it from Amy Says So. I don't hide it. Um, I do have a Step Parent Survival Kit, and if you subscribe to my email list, uh, which I will invite you regularly to do, um, um, then I will offer you a variety of other tools and techniques because uh, the more information and tools and strategies you have, the better your odds of success, honestly. Absolutely. And like you said at the beginning of our discussion, I, this is an area where people need a lot of support and there isn't a whole lot of structured support outside of maybe family therapy. So really, I really love what you're doing and Thank I you. love the approach you take. It's just, it's so, so, so important. Uh, so thanks for your time and I'm going to look forward to uh, having you back on. This was great. Thanks for spending this time with me, Maria. Thank you, Amy. Take care.